Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are glad you are here with us, and but just by showing up, you are already demonstrating your own smarts. Today, I am thrilled to present two of the most interesting cats I've met in quite some time. These two are perfect examples of what we like to feature on this series. Incredibly gifted people doing excellent work improving the world through their musical endeavors. Before I get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the interview itself. And also please make sure your chat is set to address speakers and attendees, not just speakers. I wanna thank our program sponsors for their support. Without it, we couldn't do what we do. I wanna thank First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmaster's brand of CBD products. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome Dan Levitin, who certainly has the pedigree to qualify as the smartest person in this room. Dan is an award-winning neuroscientist, musician, and best-selling author. His research encompasses music, the brain, health, productivity, and creativity. He's published more than 300 articles in journals, including Science, Nature, PNAS, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and The Wall Street Journal. His research has been featured in 19, featured over 1,900 times in the popular press. Dan is the author of four New York Times best-selling books, This Is Your Brain on Music, The World in Six Songs, The Organized Mind, and Successful Aging, as well as an international bestseller, A Field Guide to Lies. A popular public speaker, he's given presentations on the floor of Parliament in London to the US Congress, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. He's consulted for a number of companies, including Apple, Booz Allen, Microsoft, the US Navy, Sonos, Philips, Sony, Fender, and AT&T. Dan earned his BA from Stanford in Cognitive Science, his master's and PhD in Cognitive Psychology with a PhD minor in Music Technology from the University of Oregon, and completed postdoc training at Stanford University Medical School and UC Berkeley in Neuroimaging and Perception. Did I tell you guys he's the smartest one in this room? <laughs> As a musician, tenor sax, guitar, vocals, and bass, he's, a, he's performed with Mel Torme, David Byrne, Roseanne Cash, Sting, Bobby McFerrin, Victor Wooten, and Tom Scott. Dan has produced and consulted on albums by artists including Stevie Wonder, Steely Dan, Joni Mitchell, and on films, Good Will Hunting, one of the best movies ever made, and Pulp Fiction, also one of the best movies ever made. And has, managed, and has been awarded 17 gold and platinum records. He's currently the founding, the founding Dean of Arts and Humanities at Minerva Schools at the Keck Graduate Institute in San Fran, and is James McGill Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Neuroscience and Music at McGill University. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. And joining Dan as today's special guest is Parthenon Huxley. Parthenon is an award-winning recording artist, songwriter, singer, guitarist, and producer. He lectures at Omega Studios School of Applied Recording Arts and Sciences in Rockville, Maryland, and offers guitar, line, guitar instruction online. He's an accomplished musician in several respects. Four of Huxley's albums have earned Album of the Year awards by various press outlets. Parthenon is guitarist, singer for the orchestra, starring ELO former members, a band he joined in 1998 when it was known as ELO Part Two. In non-pandemic times, the orchestra tours the world every year to mostly sell out crowds in iconic venues such as London's Royal Albert Hall, among others. The single, I Loved Everything from Parthenon's 
Purgatory Falls, reached number one on Rolling Stone Magazine's exclusive download chart. His songs have had billboard chart success with Foreigner, E of Eels, Sass Jordan, Kyle Vincent, and Stevie Salas. Parthenon has performed on stage with Duff McKagan, Alan Parsons, Linda Rodstadt, Matthew Sweet, Jose Feliciano, Don Dixon, Colin Blundstone, Robin Zander, and London's Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Hundreds of television shows, including ACC All Access, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, E! Hollywood True Story, ABC's World Poker Tour, Fox Motor, sorry, Fox Sports, and Major League Baseball feature his instrumental production music. Parthenon portrayed the bass player of the BC 52s in the Flintstones movie, a guitarist in Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, a guitarist in Disney's Rock and Roll Mom, and a drummer in the television series Throb. His dream is to really stretch out and portray a singer. Parthenon holds a BA in journalism from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Go Heels, and was Spectator Magazine's rock critic from 1981 to 1986. He's currently writing a memoir and producing a homemade video series called Pandemic House Guy Show. Please welcome these two amazing guests into the smartest people in the room. Take it away, Dan. Well, thank you all for joining us here. Um, I have to begin by saying that in spite of, I hate to contradict the host of such things, uh, but Tom, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in this room, uh, certainly with you two here. And in fact, I'm, I'm never the smartest guy in any room. And as Parthenon will attest, when I play music, I'm never the best musician on the stage. You're far too humble, Dan, far too humble. We can tell from your CV why no one would want to interview you for this show. <laughs> Well, Parthenon, I couldn't be more delighted. Uh, Parthenon and I are friends going way, way back. And um, I've been a fan. I, I was a fan of yours before we met, of course. Um, and uh, if you'll indulge me, I thought I might just uh, share how it is that I came to know you and your music. Sure. And we can recollect on that together. Um, I was. I was a record guy. I was a junior A&R person at Columbia, as you recall, uh, when you got signed by Jamie Cohen and Ron Oberman to the LA office of Columbia to make your debut record. And there was a bidding war. I remember hearing all about the bidding war. You were the hot songwriter, singer-songwriter in LA. Uh, you're shaking your head. Was there not a bidding war? <laughs> no one ever told me. Well, I went in, I went into, I was in Oberman's office and Jamie said, you know, Warner Brothers wants him and MCA wants him. We've got to give him this much money or we're not going to get him. I love Jamie. <laughs> and that album, uh, I heard it as an advance. Jamie flew up to San Francisco and we drove to Santa Cruz. And um, back in those days, it was cassettes. So we listened to the cassette on my car stereo the whole way down to Santa Cruz, back up again. It was amazing. And everybody I played it for said it was one of the best albums they ever heard. And so I was just eager to meet you. And we met shortly after. I recall driving up to your house um, in, were you in Echo Park at the time? Yep, probably, yep. And um, you can take over the story from here, how we got our nicknames. <laughs> Persimmon and Leviathan? Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure how that came about, but I, I, uh, um, I was wondering if were any of these people who said it was the best record they'd ever heard, were they, any of them promoters, uh, record promoters for Columbia? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and Bonnie Simmons, who was a DJ at KSAN and um, KFOG, I mean, everybody. Um, and it still, it holds up. I love that record, Sunny Nights. And um, there's so much, so much great songwriting and performance on it. But I remember coming to visit you ostensibly to interview you for Billboard about the E record that you had produced. Yeah. And you lived way up on this, the top of this hill on this street where the houses weren't well marked. And I got out of my car and this old lady comes out of her house and she says, May I help you, Sonny? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I'm looking for number whatever. She says, oh, you're looking 
looking for that persimmon hospital boy, aren't you? <laughs> That's my landlord, Francis. She was from yeah. Missouri. Persimmon hospital. The, the thing I remember about Francis was I said, Francis, uh, how long do you live out in L.A.? He said, well, I've been here since. And from, where are you from? He said, Missouri. I said, why'd you leave Missouri? No, why'd you come out to L.A.? And she goes, to leave Missouri. <laughs> but um, uh, we can dive in here on that on that album. But I think what we wanted to um, what we wanted to uh, maybe uh, form our our talk today around was the hyphenate and survive idea, which is uh, well, let's start with that Sunday Nights album. For for that album, I was the guy. Uh, I was a solo artist. And in my mind, I'm the I'm the songwriter, I'm the producer, I'm the guy in the middle of the stage who's got who's singing the songs, writing the songs, and playing guitar. That was sort of the vision um, that started. You know, after I saw the Beatles when I was eight years old on Ed Sullivan, I decided not to become a pitcher for the New York Yankees or become Spider Man. Decided that maybe music was where it was at. And um, and then while I was listening uh, to Led Zeppelin or David Bowie, whoever it was under headphones as a teenager lying in bed dreaming of possibly doing this thing, I, of course, sang like Robert Plant, sang like David Bowie, played guitar like Jimmy Page. <laughs> but that's the that's the image in my head of the guy in the middle who was doing this. And and um, I've been writing songs since I was 10 years old. And and um, uh, God, there's a lot of territory starting from writing at 10 to being 30 years old or 31 years old when I was finally or already over the hill when I was signed to Columbia. Um, but that record was that sort of major label culmination of this longtime dream of being the guy in the center who was in charge. Uh, so speaking of the hyphenate and survive thing, at that point, you're a songwriter, you're a guitarist, you're a singer. Um, you've excelled at all three at that point. Um, you have David Kahn as a producer, who's a very um, autocratic style. It's a David Kahn record kind of a guy. Did you have an opportunity to try on a producer hat then, or were you uh, thinking that you wanted to? Well, we, we co-produced the record. Um, the first record I produced was an indie record in Chapel Hill. Um, um, oh, that's right. Called Buddha Buddha, uh, which became kind of a college hit down there. And, um, appeared on some compilation records and is still in my set today. It's it's a one, four, five little kind of hang on sloopy thing with a spiritual undercurrent and uh, it's never gonna leave my set. And I'm happy about it because I like playing it. Everything I do, I do with love. And that's what I, I aspire to, that's right. I was really embarrassed by those lyrics when I wrote them and figure I'm gonna get busted for this. Nobody ever gave a shit about those lyrics, but they did. Everything like I do, Buddha did with love, and that's what I compare it to. That's it's I was wonderful. Was, I, I remind was, myself of that all the time. It's it's keep your eye on the quality. <laughs> well, nobody ever busted me on those personal lyrics. Instead, they said, you know, I like that part that goes Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> which so, is so which is so clever. Like, songwriter, like take you, note, take note, songwriters. As like fishing boats understand. in the Greek in the Greek blue sea, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. As Don Dixon always says, "Wooly bully number one." <laughs> so anyway, oh, I see Jerry Lembo here from uh, Columbia just signed in. Hey, Jerry. So let me tell. Let's let's talk about. We're kind of bouncing around here, but most most people are in the business. They can understand this sort of uh, ricocheting around. So David Kahn was on the team that signed me to Columbia, and I have this story that. Um, when we when I first met, I I had moved out to L.A., but I didn't have a place yet, so I was I was going back and forth between New York and L.A. And they flew me out to L, back to L.A. because David Kahn wanted to meet with me, and uh, they put me up at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. So I'm at the pool, and you know, in the room by the pool, and it's like L.A. and it's sunny, and the guy from Columbia Records coming to talk to me. I'm going like, life is good. This is going to happen, right? So David comes in and, you know, David, he, he, he's, he's dressed in, you know, Oxford sh button down shirts and kind of, um, you know, regular, regular jeans and loafers. And he doesn't look like the, the rock hipster who's all taken, taken uh, up by himself. Very modest looking guy. But of course, he has just a ridiculous brain. So he sits me down and he goes, Columbia Records. And I said, Columbia Records. And he goes, I want you to picture a sphere. And I said, all right. He says, on the outside is Bruce and Barbara. That's Bruce Springsteen, Barbara Streisand. I say, got it. And he goes, on the outside of the sphere, there's those two guys. And then on the inside, it's a bottomless black hole. <laughs> oh, man. And he 
just sat there. That was the end of his presentation about the incredible history of Columbia Records, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, that I was all excited to join, right? That was it. And I'm sitting there going, Jesus Christ, another A&R meeting where I'm the only guy in the room. I don't have a lawyer here. I don't have a manager here. It's just me again. Because this had happened a few times before, really awkward A&R meetings. <laughs> and uh, so I thought for a second, I said, David, are you saying I shouldn't sign with Columbia? And he goes, I'm not saying that. <laughs> and I went, all right. He said, well, I've been through this ringer. I've had a, I've had a demo deal with Island. I've done this before. I don't know what's going on. I said, I, and I said to him, well, I still want to do it. And he goes, great. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction to Columbia. Well, so let's get back to the hyphenate thing. So um, the, the album is great. Uh, but it doesn't uh, earn out, as they say. Mm -mm. And um, then you've got to regroup. Uh, you're freed from your uh, contract at Columbia. What do you? And what do you do next? Well, fortunately, I was signed uh, before Columbia. I was signed to MCA Music Publishing as a staff writer. It was a co-publishing deal, so I had 100% of the writer share and 50% of the ownership share. So a uh, good deal. And they had advanced me like 10 grand the first year to live off of, which I was still capable of. Um, got a little tiny apartment in Echo Park and up on one of those hills and, and uh, lived off it. And my job was to write songs, which I did anyway. So um, I, was, I was pretty thrilled to be signed as a songwriter. So they were still behind me. They said, the hell with Columbia, you know, let's make another record. And so um, some of you people have probably heard of Chris Lord Algae and Tom Lord Algae, these two amazing producers. I worked with Jeff Lord Algae, the third alert, <laughs> who said he was a producer, but it was actually just a great engineer. And we ended up making a record that I did not really like. I kind of went with the flow and it got to the point where I went down the path too far and we just made a record and I wasn't crazy about it. So well, let's hold on there because this is, a, this is an important pivot point, I think, for everybody in the room. And I'm in the extended room of uh, people who have uh, logged in here, including my old friend Rick Olson. Um, the the idea that um, you have respect for somebody who's doing things in your field and that they might know better than you is um, a, con a compelling one, right? Uh, you. You know, I work with an editor and my editor will say stuff and I often find myself thinking, well, I, I don't know about that, but he's the editor. He must know. Uh, you and I have been working on your memoirs, which are excellent. And I make uh, all kinds of suggestions and I'm sure you're scratching your head with some of them going, no, I'm not going to do that. So because, you know, ultimately you have to be the judge of what you think is your best work. But here you are with uh, the third Lord Alge brother. And you somehow felt either intimidated or like, um, you know, maybe you should be more collaborative. What was, what was your experience of that? Here, here's the thing. He, he saw us. He saw us play live. And my band at the time was Rob Ladd on drums, incredible, who went on to play with Roger Daltrey. Jen Condos on bass, went on to play with Don Henley and Stevie Nicks, and. Um, uh, lots of other people, and Rusty Anderson, who's now Paul McCartney's guitarist. Uh, so my band's pretty good. Now, Paul McCartney, uh, yeah, didn't didn't he used to have a, a band called Wings? That's right. Yeah, um, Silver Beetles too. Um, so uh, uh, J Jeff Lord Algae saw the band and 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 I and you know loved the band, and he and I said, uh, well, Jeff, um, you know, you, you say you're an engineer, but you're ready to take that step to to uh, being a producer. So let's do it. Let's start pre-production. Let's talk about what we're going to do. And he goes, oh, no, no, we're going to record the, the, that live show I saw. We'll just record that. And I said, no, that, that, there's, there's songs in there that are not album songs. They're live songs. And, and I, like to, I like my albums to have an identity. And so trust me, trust me, trust me. We'll get in. You, wait till you hear the sounds. So he got great sounds. I said, OK, we go in. We got great sounds in the headphones. The band does sound great. He's very enthusiastic. And I kind of just went along. I started to slide away from my position. And I look back at it now and say, well, obviously, this is where you stop and say, sorry, Jeff, you're a great engineer, <laughs> but you didn't do pre-production with me. You're not committed to what's in my head. We're done. Which, you know, I can easily make that speech right now in 2021. 
Uh, but back then, I just felt like, you know, we're, we're going somewhere with this, and I'll write it. And I, and I liked about 30% of what we finished with. Um, and some of that stuff, the stuff I did like, ended up coming out on an album called Mile High Fan, uh, recordings from the late 80s and early 90s with that band. So, um, but anyway, uh, it, is a, it, is a, it wasn't so much being intimidated as it was, I made a decision to go along. And, and I think as an artist, that's dangerous if you consider yourself to have a vision in your head of what should be next, you know? And um, anyway, it's just a decision I, I look, it's one of, the, one of the few things I kind of regret. Um, it's interesting because um, in, a, in, a, in a weird parallel way, I kind of had this same conversation with Stevie Wonder some years ago where he was saying that, he, he was saying that he had the impression that after about 19, 89 or 90, people didn't regard his, his albums as highly as they had before. And he was trying to figure out what that was. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to gingerly step around the fact without agreeing with him, this, the post-1990 stuff can't, isn't, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he's given us enough good, he can do whatever he wants. Nobody has the right to tell him. He owes us nothing. What's that? He owes us nothing. Exactly. But he's asking. He's asking an honest question. So, you know, we got to talking and I said, well, so what, what changed? What's, what's different in, in the way you work, you know, between, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and the 90s and forward? Well, he said, I realized that all these engineers and people that I work with, um, they've got families now. And, you know, we used to work 16 hour days and, you know, we'd work in the middle of the night and they wanted to sleep in with their kids, you know, in the home with their kids, be, be there when the kids wake up. And so, you know, we stop work early. Uh, we, we just don't have the same kind of approach to getting everything just right. And uh, the, the idea of getting along with people is uh, always a difficult one when you're doing anything that you care about. Well, it, it um, yeah, and, and I think as you, one of the benefits that we're, again, banging around, one of the benefits of get, becoming an older musician is now I know exactly who I like to play with. <laughs> I know exactly what kind of engineer I want. I know exactly what kind of bass player, what kind of drummer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm the boss of my albums now. Um, of course. And yet a, still with all of that, you condescended and played a couple of gigs with me. Well, I like to maintain touch with the little people. <laughs> no, I appreciate but, um, that. But getting back, getting back to this hyphenated idea. So here I was, I've got an album on Columbia that doesn't do much. And I've got an album that I don't even like that I made for MCA. And now MCA says, you know, Parthenon, we're into you for X amount of dollars now after these two years. We've given you a bonus because you signed with Columbia, a bonus because the album actually came out. Um, and we've put some money into a record that looks like it's not going anywhere. So we'd like you to start co-writing with other people. And they said, have you ever co-written? And I said, of course, you know, I hadn't, but um, I said, of course. And so they hooked me you up. You were just with, trying to get along. <laughs> get along. I'm a reasonable guy. So um, Betsy Anthony found through this guy, manager named Carter, a guy named E, who, you know, later became- John Carter. John Carter. Put it in the strawberry alarm clock. He, uh, he wrote uh, wrote the lyrics to um, Incense and Peppermints. Incense and Peppermints, and but he was a manager for a long time, and he had found this guy E, uh, who was living in a little apartment um, and making great songs on four track cassette demos, and and we hooked we hooked up, and the first song we wrote was something called Hello Cruel World. I took E into MCA, and instead of being on um, uh, what happened to that picture? Oh, and instead of being on um, uh, four track cassette, suddenly E was recording in 16 track, you know, full, full fledged studio. They heard the record, they heard the song that we recorded, that first song, Hello Cruel World. And, and um, David Segerson, the president of Polydor, said, Oh, is that, that's E working with Parthenon? Well, Parthenon should be a co producer of this record. So suddenly I'm co writing songs with E. I'm now a co producer. And then we go on tour opening for um, Tori Amos for a month, um, 30 dates across the country. And now I'm a side man playing acoustic guitar and singing background vocals for E as he's on his keyboard player. We have a bass player, Chris Solberg from Santana's band. 
Um, so now we're starting to hyphenate. <laughs> and, and basically this is survival mode. You know, it's like, take your opportunities. I really liked E and I liked his songs. I thought he was a really interesting writer. And, and we worked really together as co-writers on his songs because um, I'm a parts generator. I can sit around and guitar and make up stuff and he would go, what's that? And I said, nothing, I'm just playing. And he goes, well, that's the intro to the next song. So keep doing that. And we'd work really, really quickly. Um, and we, we, we'd structure a song beginning to end, which is not like how I work. I like to fuss with things for a long time, beginning to end. And then he'd say, I'm gonna go in the next room and write the lyrics. He'd come back 30 minutes later with the full lyrics, like amazing finisher. So we ended up writing probably 20 songs together. I think eight of them maybe ended up on records. Um, and that was, that was a really good lesson for me. It was like, oh, collaborate. Now I'm supporting his vision for his thing, which I understood because how much I wanted it for me. And, um, you know, he was the boss, but I was there. I had a little more experience in the studio and was a better guitar player. Um, he was a great piano player and singer and drummer. And I saw his vision. I mean, he had his thing. He had a sound. It was it was very, very nice project to work on. And playing live, all his songs are sad and, and the chatter. So in between, we would make jokes like Johnny and Ed, uh, aging myself there, Johnny and Ed. And then we play these sad songs and we make jokes again. And the crowd was kind of like going like, <sighs> eventually we got standing ovations for this little dog and pony show we had, which was cool. So, um, I wasn't where I was in the vision of the 14 year old singing like Robert Plant and playing like uh, Eric Clapton, but I was still on stage. I'd learned I was in a support role and I found certain things were nice about it too. It's like, oh, he has to do all the interviews. I get to go back to the hotel. <laughs> uh, I don't have to do all the crap. I don't have to listen to the label or the manager. I'm just there for the ride and I'm getting paid to do this job, which ultimately is how we're gonna survive anyway. We're gonna keep getting paid to do something in this business because the ultimate goal is don't get a real job. Obviously, this is the musician's dream. Um, so. Uh, there we were, that's like, where are we at now? Um, early 90s, and I'm still surviving, even though I'm not exactly in the right position there. Well, so rather than, uh, we could spend, we could spend a couple hours going through this chronologically, which would be a lot of fun, but I'm thinking that in the interest of time, let's uh, pop out uh, to a, a more general level of abstraction here which is, um, and by the way, the, 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 chronol the chronological thing is fascinating and I know it'll be in your memoir and people are gonna wanna, um, sorry if I blew the surprise about the memoir, but, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm thinking that the, there's a lesson here um, that is universal, not just for musicians or people in the, in the business world, but for anybody. And you embody that lesson better than anyone I know, which is you decide what it is you want to do. And for many of us, it's, it's a vision that comes about when we're 13 or 14 or 15, and we pursue it. And as you get closer and closer to it, um, you realize, well, I didn't know it, it involved this, and I don't really like that part, or I really would like to do that, but I'm not I'm not as good as, at that as I am at this thing over here. Uh, and you keep redesigning your, um, one has to keep redesigning one's notion of what the career is gonna look like. And then in your case, you've been subjected to a lot of, I would say, um, unpredictable forces, some bad luck, some deals that didn't work out. And yet you never wavered in your commitment to make a life and to make your living out of music. And to do that, you had to hyphenate. You had to become um, not just the, um, the Eric Clapton on the stage. You became a singer in a large band, one of several singers in a large band where you weren't writing most of the material. You became a singer in your own band. You became a producer and a co-producer. You helped write songs with the members of Foreigner and other bands. You, but that's just scratching the surface. At each juncture, an opportunity came to you that you might never even have thought to yourself, oh, I didn't even know that was a job. I didn't even know people did that. Uh, and rather than saying, well, no, that's, that's not what I wanted to do, you embodied a great flexibility, 
which allowed you to stay in music. And I think the Flintstone story is one of my favorites about that. <laughs> well, I mean, the Flintstones and all those movies, which I kind of put in there as a little bit of a joke, the, the Flintstone stuff and the dragon, Bruce Lee, that's LA low hanging fruit. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, we need a guitar player. Oh, Parthenon's sitting right there. How about you? Can you do it? Are you busy? No, I'm not. Surprise, shock, shock. And, um, you know, and I mean, I, I end up, <laughs> I end up with the fur thing and I'm playing a Gibstone bass in the BC 52s. You know, and there's John Goodman at the snack table. I mean, it's awesome. But that's just, those are little Hollywood slices of life. I mean, uh, those are kind of the fun bits. The, but the, you got paid for it. Sure, I got paid for it. Yeah. And, and who knew that was a job? Yeah, I didn't know you could do that. I, what, I'm, I'm now going to be in the Flintstones movie? Because I think it was Gina Shock who recommended me. And Gina was a writer at MCA. And speaking of Gina Shock, the drummer of the Go-Go's, of course, um, we wrote a couple of songs uh, at the end of my tenure with MCA. And there was a guy named Jim Jacobson who was sitting, uh, who had also written with Gina. We're in a session at MCA. And after the session, Jim says, hey, I really like the way you play guitar. Can you come over to my house next week and do some session work? And I said, absolutely. I go up to his place. We take my AC-30. We lug it down into the basement. I get my guitar sound. And he goes, doop, 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 doop. Just hits a click track. And he says, play. I said, play what? And he goes, play anything you want. And I said, okay, well, how about like... And I did that for about a minute or whatever. And he goes, great, do it again. A little different. Okay. You know, whatever it was. And he says, play a solo over the first one. We did this for about 25 minutes and it just, you know, all this stuff is just made up. And he says, that was awesome. Here's $200. See, I want to do it again next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, do what? I mean, <laughs> you'll see. So I go back next week. He plays me a song. It's got strings and keyboards and all this sort of stuff. And he goes, check it out. And I went, okay, am I in there? And he goes, yeah, that's all. All the guitar stuff is yours. And I said, it doesn't sound like what I played. He says, well, I've manipulated it a bunch. <laughs> so this was early. This is pre Pro Tools, but it was Fostex digital recording where you could take a bit and throw it anywhere you want. You could reverse it. You could, you know, I mean, what we all absolutely take for granted now in recording, of course, you can do anything, you know. But this was like, what happened to my guitar stuff? And he said, well, I chopped it up, you know. So anyway, I said, well, what is this music for? And he goes, it's production music. I said, what's that? Well, it's also called library music. I said, what's that? And he goes, it's it's all the music that's underneath every commercial you've ever heard, every movie trailer you've ever heard, every sports announcement like Georgia Bulldogs versus Florida Gators, gung, 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 gung. There's music under there. He says, I've done this for 15 years. I had 15, uh, I had 22 minutes in pulp of music in Pulp Fiction. I, I did a, 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 a Baywatch offspring show, you know, I've done ballet. So Jim's a, you know, a Stanford and Chicago Mus uh, Music Institute uh, guy who really knows all that stuff. I'm the guitar player. Between us, we ended up working for the past 25, 30 years doing production music for uh, places like Killer Tracks and Mega Tracks and others like that. <clears throat> I didn't see Again, that. Who, who knew that was a job? And when Jonathan yeah. Runman named his solo album Public Library, it never occurred to me that maybe he was talking about library music. There's, I had no idea you could do such a thing. Um, and to tell you that, to be frank, my BMI heavily depends on that production music that's, that's sure. in the whole poker tour and all those things we listed at the beginning of the show. Because Killer Tracks does a good job, now Universal Music, gets a good job of, does a good job of shipping that stuff out to all their, you know, all their clients and connections all over the world, which I would never do. I'm trying to write the next do, 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 you know. <laughs> So, and in that deal, of course, when you work in a, with a production company, it's a work for hire. So they own the publishing. If they, if they le uh, license that song to Honda, they get the, they get the, um, the money for that, but I get the writer's share on the back end. So I don't have publishing on it, but I get paid in advance. I, Jim and I already make, you know, 1200 bucks per track um, up front. So we're ahead of the game for something we'll spend three or four or five hours on. Anyway, it's another hyphenate. It's production music creator that I, you know, and it's all in film and TV. I call, I call it composing for film and TV if I want to. <laughs> but it's really just coming up with genre specific sort of bits of music that I don't have to sell my soul over. I'm not all, 
you know, trying to write the perfect thing. I'm just trying to write something really high quality piece of music that will work under picture, you know. And um, so again, that's another hyphenate, another another part of keeping me alive in this business. I still have a guitar in my hand, you know. Yeah. And still composing, and it's turned out to be a, a great source of mail money. You know, four times a year, BMI shows up in my in my bank account. So it's really something because um, all along there must there must have been moments when you thought. I mean, there must have been times over the last 40 years where you wondered, uh, I mean, unless you, you have a trust fund that I don't know about, uh, were there times when you wondered, well, I'm not sure I'm going to make my rent next month or the month after, or I'm going to have to move to a smaller place? And I called it the monthly miracle. I have always paid my rent. Uh, and I, it was when I was on my own, because I've been married three times and my second wife passed away. So I had, a, especially a time after that, I called it a monthly miracle. I mean, I had no idea. And could because I'm either working or I'm not. You know, I mean, you either something's coming, come, something has come down the pike or not. It's very, there's been, yeah, there's been horrible, sketchy times for sure. Um, but your commitment, did, did it waver ever? No. And I think I'm just an idiot. Um, I think it's like my, my commitment to not working a real job is very strong. I'm a terrible employee because if I'm working for somebody, I'm really thinking about songs. That's been true all my life. You don't really want to hire me. Um, but also, I, I feel like I'm also kind of, um, as I got older, more and more people knew about me. I mean, my work has always been my calling card. It hasn't, I'm not a great hustler. Uh, I wish I was a little bit better at it, but uh, my work has, all, people have worked for me based on what I've done, worked with me based on what I've done or I'm in the room at the right time, that kind of thing. Like um, this other thing that I never knew was coming down the pike, uh, Jeffrey Foskett, who was in the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson's band, uh, we met at a little festival in Orange County and um, south of LA and we were each just playing five songs. We weren't getting paid. It was one of these Poptopia festivals and nice people and you get to play and it's a sunny day. What's wrong with that? And, I, and Jeff saw my band play and I saw his band and we're backstage. You're my new best friend. Oh, you're amazing. No, oh, you're amazing. Oh, you know, like musicians do. And, but we actually kept Nobody ever does that with me. <laughs> <laughs> so he, we kept in touch. I ended up, he covered a song of mine. I played on it, blah, 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 blah. And then Eric Troyer, who is this American guy who right. plays in Electric Light Orchestra Part Two is friends with Jeff Foskett, unbeknownst to me, of course. Eric calls up Jeff and says, hey, I sang on Double Fantasy, John Lennon's album. I never got a gold record. Jeff, you're friends with everybody at Geffen. Can you see if you can get me a gold record? You know, I just, I don't need every gold record I've been on, but I want that one. And he goes, sure, 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 I'll do that. And he says, by the way, uh, we're looking for a new guitar player, singer, songwriter for ELO Part 2. And Jeff says, cancel the auditions. I just met the guy. This P. Hux is your guy, blah, 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 blah. Eric calls me. I'm doing a writing session at home with a band called Splendid from Australia. And um, uh, he says, you know, uh, do you think you'd be interested in this job? I said, yeah. And I said, who's in the band? I'm looking at, I pulled out some ELO albums from my <laughs> closet and I'm going, who's in the band? And I auditioned in Birmingham, England uh, uh, about a month later and got the gig. And suddenly I'm in a second, sort of an offshoot classic rock band. ELO Part 2 is not the original ELO from the 70s, but it is. There were four original members in the band in the late 90s when I joined. And they said, learn 38 songs and we'll see you in Uruguay. And you'd be playing to like, if I'm not mistaken, you'd be playing to like 20,000 people. I think the biggest crowd we ever did was 70,000 on a beach in Spain. And we've played bars. I mean, we've played everything. I mean, ice, ice skating rinks, uh, uh, you know, uh, bull rings. Album. Prior to ELO, what was the biggest audience you ever had? Mm, probably with well, not ELO, but yeah, yeah, not ELO, not ELO, <laughs> ELO Part Two or the orchestra. No, probably with Don Dixon in a in the middle of a Belgian city, the town square, probably seventeen thousand people, something like that. I did some touring in Europe with Dixon and in the states, so that was probably it. And Dix, Dixon should have appeared in this in this conversation earlier, but anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, it's I, I've you know you suddenly you go from your dream, which is either 
happening on Columbia or in Tatters. Or then after I was on MCA, I got signed to an indie label called uh, Black Olive and made a record called P. Hux Deluxe, which I was one of my favorite albums that I've ever made. Um, you're either doing that or somehow these other things happen. And again, part of it's being in the right place at the right time. I mean, Jim Jacobson, the production music guy, I was just sitting there, you know, or he was just sitting there and I was playing. He wasn't going to scour all his friends and say, "Who? what guitar players do you know? It just happened. He heard me and it, the evidence was there. You know, it's that it's that when I lecture at this music school in, in up in Rockville, I say, you know, being at the table is so important. Being in the room is so important because it's a lot of we're lazy. You know, it's like, oh, you can play. Oh, can you put a solo on my album? <laughs> it's like it's just if you're in the room, it really it really helps. And um, so now yeah. it's like singer, songwriter, guitarist, sideman, producer, classic rock replacement part, uh, production music guy. You know, it's just um, but it, it keeps things moving forward. I keep learning new skills. I did a couple commercials for Japan too. You know, it's the oddball things. Oh, I taught Harvey Keitel how to hold a guitar for this movie. <laughs> <It> was... <laughs> oh God. Um, so it's not like this towering and then we did this and then I imagined this and it happened. And then I imagined this and it happened. That's not my story at all. Um, it's, it's more kind of a zigzaggy adventure and, and, um, uh, and out of it, like, um, I've, I've, I think I have 10 albums of my own. So I'm not super productive over the last 30, 40 years. I take my time with them. Uh, those are the, out of all this work, I have to say that the albums that I make under my name are the things that I spend the most time for. And I'm so committed to every single note because nobody's in charge of it but me. Every single note on those records, I stand behind. Uh, everything else I do, I'm up, I'm up for <laughs> criticism. <laughs> But those records I stand behind completely. And um, so that's one thing I guess I've had a privilege to do. I don't know. Um, probably owning, uh, I think I own my last four or five albums. Um, some of them have been helped by Kickstarter, which is uh, one of the great things the internet ever came up with, um, where you can actually get funded for this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, one way or another, if our theme is hyphenate and survive, one way or another, that has kept going. Um, this idea of showing up in the room reminds me of a conversation I had with, uh, with one of the great session guitarists of our generation, Dean Parks. And, you know, when he, when he first moved to LA and, you know, there was a lot of competition always for session guitarists here. Uh, I'm in LA, by the way. Uh, and, uh, you know, I said, well, how did, how did you become the, the go-to guy? He says, well, basically a version of what you said, people are lazy, right? So he, he'd be asked to show up at a session with say a six string acoustic guitar, but he'd always bring a van full of other stuff and he'd load it all into the room. So he'd have a 12 string, he'd have a couple of electrics, he'd have um, an electric sitar and a saxophone and you know anything that, or dobro, anything anybody could possibly want. And often after he did his part, the producer uh, would say to somebody else in the room, oh, you know, I think, I think a 12 string would sound good on this. Let's find a 12 string player. And Dean would say, well, I have mine right here. Uh, or, you know, even saxophone. He's a hellacious saxophone player. He got the work because he was one stop shopping. And of course, everything he plays is brilliant. But I mean, that's, the brilliance is only part of it um, because there's a lot of brilliant guitarists and I don't think they would have said, okay, we'll go home, get your 12 string, we'll have you back tomorrow. Oh, never gonna happen, never gonna happen. Yeah. If you can make it happen in the next two minutes, we're in business. Yeah, <clears throat> because we have a short attention span. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working here. You know, can, can you get up and sing right now? Yeah, okay, cool, do it, please. <laughs> Why are you not in there singing yet? <laughs> exactly. Well, so um, Tom, told me that uh, it's okay for us to be self-serving and self-promotional. So to that end, I want to ask you about a few things that you have cooking right now. And one of them that I just love, and it has to do with the, the lockdown. Um, you know, when I, I think when the lockdown first happened in mid-March of last year, the coronavirus lockdown, of course, uh, for, for those of you 30 years in the future who are looking back on this tape, <laughs> um, not I those think, other lockdowns I, <laughs> I think I think those of us 
in the, the gig economy, didn't know how long it was going to last, didn't know what was going to happen. I make um, a good part of my living by giving public talks, doing sure. speaking games. All of them were canceled for the whole year. And, and the ones that weren't eventually got canceled. Um, and I think musicians were particularly, particularly vulnerable. Um, and you came up with this pandemic house guy thing, which alongside John Fogarty's uh, attempts to, um, to make something out of lockdown with his family, his series of very highly produced, professionally cinematography, professionally cinemagraphed. Does he use the same camera I do? Probably. No, no, I, he, they got stuff on dollies. and <laughs> But alongside his, the Pandemic House Guy is terrific. It's it's kind of like a vaudeville show. There's some, you, you want to talk about uh, what you're doing there and how people can check yeah. it out? Well, it's on YouTube. It's the Pandemic House Guy show. It's a play on Parthenon Huxley, Pandemic House Guy. And I just, um, I have all- Oh, by the way, how did you get your name? Yeah. Uh, some other time. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but Pandemic House Guy is, uh, uh, it's just like a little 12, 13, 14, 15 minute um, TV show. And, you know, I, I, it's in this office where I am now. And that's my television studio. I do everything on iMovie on the phone because you can manipulate it with your finger. You don't have to be, you know, <laughs> you don't have to know anything. And, and as uh, a guitarist, you're good with manipulating things. Well, with there, so, I, I just got it. I just thought the, the birth of it was as soon as the as soon as the lockdown happened, there were a lot of sad dining room live concerts, you know, just a lot of people playing. Hey, man. And they're, you know, just want to, you know, so sorry we can't play live. And, you know, so I'm going to play a bunch of songs in my dining room, which doesn't sound particularly good. And, you know, because Zoom was still in terms of the mass public and infancy and we you know nobody knew how to make this streaming thing really look like anything so i didn't want to do that i didn't want to say well i'm not going to go i don't really want to go from my band here in town playing at jam and java under the lights and sounding amazing or the orchestra playing on tour and sounding amazing and then go to sad dining room so i i thought if i can add a little bit of production value not that i know what i'm doing but if i can add a little bit of production value like make the song sound good and make and and write some jokes and play some characters. I kind of got carried away with some characters, and and I've done uh, the the ninth one is coming out on Saturday, but I ended up doing this show and 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 there they there um, there's a continuance from each show to the next. Like I'll leave certain things hanging and, and and characters will reappear. And I just did this little goofy TV show called Pandemic House Guy. It's on YouTube. Please watch uh, and subscribe. And I I'm really proud of them because the only and the only <laughs> If it makes me crack up, I think I've got something. You know what I mean? If I'm laughing, I, I'm making it and I'm laughing, I think I've got something. And um, and I do a thing called Mistaken Medleys where you have a song in your head and another one butts in, uh, which happens to me all the time. I say, God, what do those songs have to do with each other? Why am I singing that song when I started with this one? So I've, there's some reoccurring things. Um, super fun. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm not getting paid for it. There's a button where you can... You can voluntarily pay some money. That's awesome. Some people do that. It's great. Um, the uh, the Jane Sibbery model. Is that what she does? Yeah, I mean, she 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 left her record label. She just she you pay her what you want for her yeah. CDs, for downloads, whatever. It's all the honor system. And she she tells me she's now. Uh, we actually did a show together. Jane and I and David Byrne played for the New Yorker festival as a uh, quartet with Graham Hawthorne on percussion. Uh, it was amazing. Um, and um, she was saying that she makes as much money now on this honor system as she did when she was with a major label because, wow. you know, there was recoupment and they were taking all this. I mean, they were selling far more units by a factor of 20, but she was seeing so much less money. Right. If you're making, if you're making nine points. Right. Yeah. So, um, so you got Pandemic House Guy, which is an honor system. You sell T-shirts like the one you're wearing. This is the new uh, Beforkestra T-shirt, um, which, <laughs> again, we're trapped in our houses. We come up with weird ideas. 
Uh, there is a there is a TV show, not not a musical show, uh, on HBO Norway called Beforeners, and it's a and it's an amazing show, six episodes. I yeah, sure, Beforeiner. Everybody watch Beforeiners on HBO. But anyway, I thought Beforeiners. Well, how about Before Orchestra? So this T-shirt has pictures of all of us. Here's my high school photo when we were. 17, 18, 19, we were in, and, and we're doing a contest for these shirts about guess which bands, who was in these bands at this age, and blah, 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 blah. You can get these on my site. The other thing besides the YouTube channel is parthenonhuxley.com. Uh, that's where all my records are. That's where all the, that's where these t-shirts are. Um, and that's my, another little, you know, another little source of income for me. Not much, but uh, it, everything helps. Um, I think this gig economy hyphenate thing really translates into how many 1099s do you do a year, right? <laughs> and I do about seven. I've got I've got my BMI, I've got my PayPal, my website stuff, I've got the gigs with the orchestra, or at least I used to, and uh, we've had 20 or so uh, canceled so far. We hope to be back in business in the fall or, you know, post-vaccine. And I've got my teaching, I also teach, and blah, 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 blah. So, um uh, all that adds up to kind of making a living. And um... yeah, the teaching thing is interesting because uh, my friends who play in major world class orchestras like the LA Phil, you'd think, you know, first violinist in the LA Phil, they got it made. No, sir. They're all teaching. Yeah. Well, I never, I, I was standing at a bus stop with my five year old daughter 15 years ago, and one of my neighbors said, I'd moved to Maryland from LA, and one of my neighbors said, You're the musician, right? And I said, Yeah. And he says, Do you teach? And I went, mm, Yes, I do. Because, <laughs> you know, sure, why not? And uh, I started with like two students, and after a year, I had 20 sometimes a week. And I, of course, I'm learning way more than they are because they said, can you, can you, there's this band called Black Keys now, can you learn this song? And, you know, the kid has, has been trying for a week to figure it out and it takes me about five minutes. And I go, yeah, it goes like this and blah, 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 blah. And he's using a whammy, he's making this happen and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, that's amazing. So it's really nice for me. And I get to learn about a thousand new songs. I have a guitar in my hand six days a week and I get to pass on the classic rock knowledge or the new stuff, whatever they bring me to these kids, which is really, really great. And hilarious too, because you know I'll get a I'll get a twelve year old in my in my office here, and I'll say, okay, uh, we just met. You know, what are your favorite bands? Uh, Deep Purple, uh, Led Zeppelin, um, David Bowie. I go, dude, did we go to high school together? You know, <laughs> it's it's just kind of incredible. And here, away from Los Angeles, and away from Nashville, and away from New York, and away from London, here, music is still that mysterious, amazing thing made by super people, which is what I thought it was when I was a kid. You know, they, they, it's, this is not a musical town. It's not, you don't see magic. Like in Nashville, I go to any dumpy bar and there's a guitar player plays circles around me. Every, I'm Tom, I'm sure you can attest to this. I mean, there's so much talent in LA and Nashville and places like this. Here I have a little more status. Well, Eric Clapton said the same thing. Uh, we met at Air Studios in London in the 80s and uh he was saying you go into any bar in in england and you'll find a guitarist who's better than me and he really believed it you know uh eric's good <laughs> but no i i uh it, it's the teaching thing has been really amazing has been really really uh, way more fun and way more beneficial uh than i thought and 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 also i'm i'm, I'm showing these kids how to really play the stuff we're not i'm not going to spend a half hour with you to learn how to play it crappy you know we're going to do it just like jimmy page you know that have kind you of... ever read the south african novelist jm katsia no uh pulitzer prize winner uh wonderful uh novelist and essayist and he has this uh book about being a, a college professor and a line that i think of often which is that um the great irony is that um, the the students come to learn something, and it's always the teacher that walks away having learned so much more than they. Yeah, completely. and I've, that's certainly been true for me. And getting back to the theme of the smartest guy in the room, um, I, I truly believe that when I'm in a classroom with students, I really am not the smartest guy in the room. I happen to know some stuff they don't know. But I always walk away from a classroom or a lab meeting with my laboratory, having learned a great deal. And um, I wonder if they've learned even a fraction of what I did. But 
it's 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 not just an irony it's a great pleasure we you and i get to be perpetual students and we get to push the boundaries of what we know through this contact uh in teaching yeah absolutely absolutely i mean i i get brought songs by bands i've never heard of them they've got four million views on youtube or 400 million you know it's like who's that you know i mean it works both ways it's great um continuing education and um yeah it's all good. I, I, I think the varied path is uh, it's kept me from being bored or maybe even too far up my own butt. You know, like when you're if you're always making the next record and it's popular and people are expecting a certain thing. Yeah, I, that's kind of the dream. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> but but maybe maybe bouncing around like this has given me perspective on my own stuff. I know that I'm compiling songs now that the pandemic has given us the gift of time besides the pandemic and and stuff like that. I've, I've got about 19 songs queued up. For, as possible inc uh, inclusion on my next record, and and I'm I'm very excited by them, and a certain uh, several of them I'm really excited by. I'm con I'm convinced they're really good, uh, and others will will come along. So um, that happens. You know, it takes me two, three, four years to to really kind of get up the the list and 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 have it cook in my head for a while to to make the next album that I will honestly say. Uh, will be a good record. I, I know it'll be good because I've I've cooked it, you know, properly. Um, not to say if making fast records isn't a fun thing I'd like to do, um, too. But uh, anywho. So where are we at, Tom? Where are we at, Dan? Are we okay? I see that we have four minutes left. Yeah. Any, are there any questions or anything? Or did, have you seen anything? I'm, I'm looking at the questions go by. Um, I was just going to... Uh, there, there doesn't appear to be an actual question that I've seen other than um, what I've already asked. The uh, author I mentioned is Kotzea, C-O-E-T-Z-E-E, -E -E, wonderful writer. Somebody, uh, Pants, just asked about that. Um, I was just going to add that you, um, you've been uh, an inspiration to me in, in, in so many ways, uh, but one of them is I've learned a lot from you about being flexible and I've had to be flexible in my own career and with my own aspirations. Like you, I'm not, I would not be a good person to have working for a company. I've just, I have, I, I wanna do what I wanna do. I don't wanna have to, I, I'm not a good employee. I'm much better as an independent. And um, being a professor is about as close to that as you can get. The, you've also been an inspiration in your persistence of excellence in music and in your mentorship to me, because um, I started playing these songs of mine years ago, and you basically went, no, no, no. And then about four years ago, I mean, you never told me to stop working at it, and you gave me some tips along the way. And about four years ago, you finally said, who is this? Yeah, you came up with a great record. You, you worked with a producer who found something in your voice and it went from wherever it was before to a really, really sweet spot. And it, I was I was stunned by how, um, not that you could do it, but that you worked with somebody who found it and helped you with it. And the tracks were lovely and, and subdued and elegant and your voice was great and the writing was really good. And I was like, holy shit, this is really a, a, a fantastic leap. And, and I think that's maybe, you know, working with the right, working with the right people. Um, I, I'm, not sure, we, I'm not sure exactly how, how it came about, but it was a, a tremendous thing. And, and I, couldn't have been, I couldn't have been more pleased. But, but before, be, I wanna talk about you mentoring me. So I am working on a memoir, such as it is. I'm up to about 275 pages, I, especially during this pandemic, I've been trying to really crank on it. And um, two, three, four, five years ago, <laughs> whatever it was, you were in town doing a. You were in town to promote one of your books, and I slipped you one page. I slipped you the first page, and I said, "What do you think of this?" And I was really nervous because it's like it's preposterous to think you can write a memoir, and it's just like, why? Who would be interested? Why would I do this? What do I? What am I thinking? I gave you one page, and you said, "Well, you need a hook, and this has a hook. I think this will make a great story." And with that simple vote of confidence, I mean, I got back in my car that day and said, man, I'm on my way with this thing. Best-selling author and buddy of mine <laughs> has just given me the blessing. And, and, and for, the first, uh, for the first 60, 70, 80 pages, 
I, you were willing to read them and give me notes. So I have I had a built-in editor before I've even had an editor. No editor has seen my my book so far. And just with your confidence, and you gave me a list of about 10 tips, which a great one is pretend every word costs you $10. So don't be afraid to take them out. And uh, which I sort of knew some of these things. I do have a journalism degree. I learned a little something at Carolina. But, um, but your advice was solid, simple, and you gave me the encouragement, which I was just so delighted. <laughs> you don't know how happy you're really. I, I walked away from that day. And um, and it's gone up to two. It's gone from that first page to 275 pages, and I think there's probably 50 more um, that I hope to finish before we are all allowed out of our cage to play live music again. Because if I don't finish the book while I am in the lockdown, I will go crazy. But anyway, thank you for that. Well, you are a great writer, and um, and you work at it. You don't just fall in love with the first thing that comes out on the page, and um, you're. You're right, that, that producer I found, Christopher Harrison, my voice used to be kind of here and he, he found something in it and he found pieces in the songs that I hadn't emphasized and uh, it was a great collaboration. Where and, can we find that album, Dan? Ah, daniellevitin.com is my website and the album is available on all the usual places, Apple Music, Google Play, it's on Spotify. You can um, download it, you can buy it through um, my website, danielinnison.com. And, you know, an interesting thing came out of it, which was completely unanticipated. Renee Fleming from the Kennedy Center heard one of the songs. Uh, well, she heard the album and she decided she wanted to record one of the songs. Insane. So we did, and I mean, I thought she wanted to record it, but she meant with me. So I put together a band uh, with Victor Wooten on bass and me playing guitar uh, and Hardy Hempel playing keyboards. And it, it was a released as a separate video. It's not the version on my album, of course, because it's Renee singing harmony, uh, but it's now on the Kennedy Center website. And oh, that's between- awesome. Between Renee and you, I'm thinking I ought to make another album and do another Kickstarter. Well, I think we're getting the signal to wrap this up. I wanted to say that, uh, Tom, it's been fantastic to be here. And Dan, uh, I love spending time with you, as you know. Um, DanLevitin.com, ParthenonHuxley.com. Or the, if you ever go to sites that aren't social media, uh, please go to those two. Um, what else, Tom? Are we, are we good? Uh, oh, by the way. I think we're going to reverse these roles, and we are going to talk more about you, Dan, at some point in the future, Tom, is if that's a possibility. Because absolutely, Dan, Dan has no, done, nobody cares about me. Dan has done some amazing stuff, and I, I would like to interview him for that. Absolutely. Let me just say this, guys. I could sit here for three more hours listening to this. This has been so inspiring, and oh. enlightening, and and Parthenon hat tip to you because you have just figured out a way to keep moving forward, as you say, hyphenate and. We've got a lot of singer songwriters, a lot of musicians, a lot of industry people in here who are really trying to figure that out for themselves day to day in the music industry. So thank you for sharing your story and your wisdom. And I I just want to thank Dan for being simply awesome. Dan, you are the smartest guy in the room. It's crazy. And I can't wait to have you back in that seat so we can learn more about what makes you tick as an artist, as a writer, as a genius. Folks, I want to wrap up by thanking the audience for coming. We're doing another one of these on Thursday, as we are wont to do. And this Thursday, we celebrate two geniuses that I also am friends with, John Esposito, the CEO and chairman of Warner Music Nashville, being interviewed by Joe Rapola. So please come to that same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. With that, folks, I'm going to sign off and simply say, be nice to each other and wear a mask. We'll hope to see you out in public soon. Later.